Well, I'd been doing uh, theoretical physics in Canada for a number of years. It was standard stuff, you know, we had experimentalists did measurements. The theoreticians came along and tried to interpret those, made calculations, and it was standard stuff, and I knew it, Green's functions, perturbation theory. I knew how to do it, and I was thinking, you know, I, I want something different. I want to do something new. I'll go somewhere, I'll take a year off. I decided to take a year off in London, and there in London was Roger Penrose, who I'm sure people may have not know the name, but he was uh, uh, the theory of everything, you know, Stephen Hawking's supervisor, and, and he and Hawking worked together on the theory of everything. That was Penrose, so I went to work with Penrose, and one day I decided I'll go across to the other department at the university, the physics department, just see what's going on. And I dropped in, and there were a group of students talking, and an older man, one of the students, a very vociferous, and he was saying, there's no absolute, there's no absolute. And the older man said, oh, yes, I see. So is that an absolute statement? I thought, wow. I followed him out of the room and said, I've got to talk to you. And he said, well, my name's David Baum. Come and see me tomorrow. So I went to see him on the following day. And uh, several times uh, a week, I would go into his office and we'd talk. We talked for two or three weeks. And then one day, I got home on the underground. I lived in South London then. And I phoned him up and said, I thought we were talking about physics, but we're not. Ah, he said, I see. What are we talking about? I said, we're talking about the nature of consciousness and the mind. He said, very good. Come and see me tomorrow. So <laughs> I went on the following day, and a whole new area opened up, which was, what is the nature of mind? What is the nature of consciousness? I think his questioning of the orthodox interpretation of quantum mechanics, which everybody accepted, it, it was widely accepted, but Bohm thought it's causing price, is causing a level of confusion, and, and we've got to go beyond that. And he also he saw uh, when uh, the two protagonists, uh, Niels Bohr and, and, and Heisenberg, you know, they, they were talking together, and uh, you know, Bohr said, "What is the meaning of quantum theory?" And, and Heisenberg, "Oh, it's simple. We just write down the equations and discuss them." And, and Bohr said, "Yes, but when we write down the equations, we talk about the equations. We use ordinary language." We're suspended in language, so we don't know what is up and what is down. That struck Bohm very forcibly. Language, the language we use is, are, are acting as a barrier. We have to go beyond language. So we become very interested in language and thought the language we speak, if I say to you, the cat chased the mouse, you have a well-defined object in space and time, a cat, you have a well-defined object, a mouse, you have something going between them, chasing. And it's very like the Newtonian worldview. You have well-defined objects interacting together. But for Bohm, it's more like a process. The underlying reality of nature is a process, it's a movement. So he spent uh, much of his life researching language and looking at what he called the hollow movement. And only in the last year of his life did he meet with the Blackwood and Cree people and discover that was their language. Verb-based languages, process-based languages. And their worldview is continuous process and transformation. So he saw at the end of his life, well, that's very much like the worldview I followed, <laughs> but it's one that Native Canadians, Native Americans followed. So that was one of his important things, language, yeah. When he was a schoolboy, Bohm, uh, Bohm was sort of unhappy. He was unhappy at home and unhappy with his father around a used furniture sales shop. And Bohm, the ambition was that Bohm would own the biggest used furniture sales shop in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. Bohm didn't want to do that. He wanted to explore ideas, and, and his father wasn't very happy about that. And he felt he lived in a rather brutal world. And one day he got hold of a science fiction story called The Skylark of Space, about a boy who travels off to other planets in a spaceship. That was his dream. If I can go to other planets, there'll be ideal worlds. So for him, this world we live in, this world of space and time, is sort of imperfect. It's an illusion. And beyond that is a much deeper reality. That was his school vision. And then as he grows up and becomes older, that becomes his vision of what he called the implicate order, that beyond the everyday Newtonian worldview, there's a much deeper order he called the implicate order. And that was what he was groping towards. How do we uncover this deeper order of the world that, that, that we live in, the implicate order, it's, which is then a process. It's a process of constantly unfolding and unfolding. It's a process in which mind and matter are no longer separate. They're unified. So it was that was what he was groping towards and, and through all of his life, yeah.
Bohm was, uh, was, was concerned with security, and he felt that security lies in fixed positions. So I have a fixed position, I'm secure. Till one day he's with friends, and they approach a stream, and with stepping stones, and he realizes to get across, I've got to go from stone to stone. And I can't just stand on a stone, stay there, go to the next stone and stay there. I'm going to have to jump from stone to stone. So I have to be, have a continuous movement. So we began to see that security lay in movement. And that, that, was, that was his new vision, movement. He arrives uh, in, uh, at Berkeley with Oppenheimer's group, and they're quite a, you know, an exceptional group of students, and you know, one of them includes Richard Feynman. So they're all very bright. And uh, at that time, they were very interested in what was called the Russian experiment, what was going on in Russia. So they were to the left. There were, some of them were Marxists, some of them were just to the left. But that was an interest, and Baum had that interest for a time and really thought, you know, something was going to come out of Russia, these experiments. So he became interested in the left. And, uh, you know, he worked, uh, he worked in Oppenheimer's group. They were all assigned positions, and um, he was very happy. Uh, he liked to, uh, you know, initially he liked Oppenheimer, he noticed how Oppenheimer, but then he saw a, a darker side to Oppenheimer, that Oppenheimer would tend to draw in a student very, very close, and then do something to alienate the student. And so Bohm felt uneasy with that. Eventually, when he had to leave Berkeley, he went to Princeton and he took a house, a room, in a house next door to Einstein. So he would met Einstein, they become close, he would go to Einstein. In the evening, Einstein would have you know, German expatriates over playing the cello, violin, have concerts, and he would go to those and talk a lot to Einstein. And <coughs> Einstein said that he felt Bohm was his spiritual son. So the two became very close, except the one thing Einstein used to say, the good Lord's uh, subtle but not malicious. And ultimately, the good Lord will show us the ultimate level of reality. And Bohm said no. Below that level is another reality. Below that is another. There are infinite number of realities. So, so Bohm and, and Einstein didn't agree. For Bohm, uh, the, the universe was inexhaustible. For, 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 for Einstein, no, there would be an ultimate level, and that would be the end of physics. So the two were very close and, and, uh, until you know, Bohm had to uh, leave North America. A plasma is called a full state of matter. There's, there's gases, there's, there's liquids, there's solids, and the fourth state is like a gas in which the gases are charged particles. So it would be a bit like what happens around the sun. You have a gas of charged particles. And in a metal, the idea was a metal, you'd have a, a lattice where all the, the nuclei are in the lattice, they're charged, and an electron runs through them. There's a gas of electrons running through. And uh, uh, Bohm's idea was, can I, like, can I look at the gas? Can I find a theory for this gas? And what he found was that, um, that the extent to which uh, an electron participated in this gas, it became relatively free. So it went back to his old idea about the Russian experiment. To what extent, if I am a member of the collective, can I have individual freedom? It seems a paradox. If I'm a member of the collective, then I, I don't have freedom. I'm part of the group. But he found to the extent to which a, an electron participated in the plasma, it became free. It became free of the interaction of other electrons. So he began to see, yes, within the plasma, within the collective, there can be individual freedom. So it was both a theory of the plasma in metals and a theory of, of, of freedom in the collective. So that, that's what he published. That established a reputation. And at the same time, he went on to start questioning the orthodoxy of quantum theory and developed an alternative interpretation, which was going to haunt him you know, for the next uh, decades or so. The uh, Americans were building the, the bomb, the atom bomb, and they felt that the Germans are the enemy of, of, of the, the, the Germans and the Russians are at war, and we should help, it's our duty to help the Russians. And many scientists, including Oppenheimer, felt we should talk to the president and suggest maybe we should, we should tell the Russians what we're doing. And in fact, the president of the United States at that time was in agreement with that, but it was Churchill who overruled him and said, you're crazy, you know, don't tell the Russians anything. But that was it, there was a sympathy. Maybe the Russians should know a little bit of what we're doing. So maybe there was sympathy among some of Oppenheimer's students. Possibly there's, you know, there are various rumors that maybe somebody talked to someone at, at, at the Russian embassy. But anyway, there was a suspicion, 
And uh, then the McCarthy investigation took place, and uh, Bohm was called before the House of America. Why was he called, though? It, well, because I guess there was some s suspicion around him because of part of Oppenheimer's group. He was asked to give names. He refused to give names. And uh, the, uh, as a result of that, he was arrested for contempt of Congress, he was sent to Washington, and in the end he was acquitted. But uh, he could not find any position. He couldn't find any university position. Uh, and I know he did write to Einstein. Einstein tried to help him, but no. The only thing was, was to leave the United States and go to Brazil. So he had no future in the States. He just had to leave, and that was it. The bomb project had ended, and now it was the peaceful uses of atomic energy. And Oppenheimer wanted to be head of that. He wanted to be running peaceful uses for atomic energy in North America, and now his security is being questioned. And I think it's clear from people unorthodox, not official letters or any documents like that, but chatting with people that Oppenheimer wanted Bohm out of the way. He didn't want to be contaminated by Bohm. Bohm was politically suspect. He was politically suspect. He'd been before the House American activities. He'd been thrown out of the states. He wanted Bohm out of the way. He wanted nothing to do with Bohm. So I think that's it. Distance himself from Bohm. Distance himself from Bohm's theory. When he was in Paris, he heard um, the denunciation of Stalin. Khrushchev denounced Stalin, and that horrified him. He was shocked. He said he walked all night in the rain in Paris because he'd believed in the Russian experiment, and he knew people said all oh, terrible things happened in Russia. But that was for Bohm. That was just propaganda. That was just propaganda. But it turned out to be true. Yeah, it wasn't an ideal experiment. There had been terrible things done, and that 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 shocked him. He was shocked that that he was shattered his faith in what had happened. And for a time, he, you know, he went, he read everything, Auspensky, all sorts of, all sorts of crazy things he read and directions he went until finally he, he, he encountered uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti and that was another important aspect of his life to encounter Krishnamurti. He heard about Krishnamurti and Krishnamurti, the, the story he would have been told or come across was that Krishnamurti was discovered by people in the Theosophical Society as a young man who was going to become the great teacher and that he was hailed as this young man, he was brought into the center of an organization, you know, put on a pedestal uh, and he went through, uh, when he was out in Ojai, California, he went through what was called the process. He went through something in which his brain was transformed. So he believed his brain had been transformed, it was unconditioned. It was completely unconditioned. So he was different from everyone else. It was an unconditioned brain and something, something spoke through him when it spoke directly. So something could speak directly through him. So Bohm wanted to meet this man and they had this meeting and I'm told partway through it, Krishnamurti was supposed to stood up you know, with pleasure or enthusiasm or whatever and said, you have seen it, sir. So that Bohm had seen it and then Bohm began to have more meetings with Krishnamurti he became a trustee of Krishnamurti's school at Brockwood Park. Uh, they had a, a number of dialogues together that were tape recorded or audio recorded, I'm not too sure, a bit of both. And several of them were collected together into, into a volume, into a book. And maybe more, more than one book came out. But, but the, these dialogues continued for some years. So we became very involved with Krishnamurti. Bohm had this meeting with Krishnamurti, the initial meeting, and uh, it went well. And at some point during the meeting, Krishnamurti is supposed to have stood up and say, Sir, you have seen it. And as a result, Bohm became quite involved with Krishnamurti. He became a trustee of Krishnamurti's school at Brockwood Park. Uh, they had a number of dialogues together that were recorded and eventually collected together into a volume. I mean, maybe one or two volumes, I can't remember how many, but those continued for some time, these dialogues with Krishnamurti. At the same time, uh, Bohm would talk to me about Krishnamurti uh, and he felt that he did believe that Krishnamurti's brain was different than anybody else's, that it had been transformed, that it was unconditioned. And he also said he felt that in the presence of Krishnamurti, it was possible that his own brain could be transformed. And he, at times, you could say he almost took it to an extreme. As remember, one day we were here in Italy and he said to me, do you think I should give up doing physics and just devote myself to Krishnamurti? 
And my reply was, uh, can, a, can a fish exist outside the goldfish bowl? So <laughs> but that was it. He was that, that extreme that maybe he should devote himself completely to having his own brain transformed. He was a member of, of, of the school, and uh, the school, it was a school, uh, a Brockwood Park school, and he was a trustee, and they had a principal, and it all went very, very well, and then the principal retired, and they introduced a, a new system of uh, running the school, and I think at that point, he became, he became a bit of disillusioned. There seemed to be some sort of bits of confusion at the school. He wondered why it wasn't cleared up, so I think he was a bit concerned that, that there was some confusion in the school, it wasn't running as well as it could, and who was responsible for that? Well, you know, for clearly it was Krishnamurti's school, so I think at that point he, he, was, he was concerned that Krishnamurti maybe wasn't taking as much responsibility as he should or whatever. It's not clear exactly what went on, but there was, there was some, a period of, 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 of sort of mixed feelings, and Bohm was feeling a bit critical of Krishnamurti at this point. After Krishnamurti had died, um, Bohm and I, we, we, we met in various places. We would meet in, in a place called the Bailey Farm Institute near Ossining in New York. We'd meet there every fall. I would come over to London and see him in his house. A couple of times he'd come over, you know, he came over to see me. But we'd talk and we would, often the talk would be about Krishnamurti. And, and it would come down to something which you could say was a little bit, I don't know if you call it painful, but troubling. Uh, which for, for Bohm was, was Krishnamurti the man he said he was? Was he, w was he the man who said he was? Was he a man with a completely unconditioned brain? If the brain was conditioned, then what about the teaching? If the brain was completely unconditioned, then you must accept the teaching for what it was. But what if the brain had been conditioned? What if he wasn't the man he said he was? So that would happen again and again. We'd meet together, and he was very troubled by that. And I think some people have, have sort of maybe tried to play down that a little, but as far as I was concerned, yes, it, w it was a painful thing for Bohm. This idea that the brain could be un unconditioned, the brain could, could maybe communicate directly with something that lay beyond it, I think that was, that was the, the idea that the brain, or this, his own brain could enter into a different state communicate with something that lay beyond it. But I don't think in any spiritual sense. I don't think there was, uh, and, and uh, when Baum went for therapy, his uh, therapist had asked him, you know, do you have a spiritual side, a religious side? He said, no, there was no, no religious spiritual side. But there was a transcendental side. I think this thing that lay beyond that he got from Krishnamurti. We discussed earlier, you know, he was in Brazil, you know, he went to Israel, he was all around the place, settled eventually in the United Kingdom, and his questioning is, is left behind his hidden variables, he's left that behind, and now he's asking, why has there been decades of work on relativity and quantum theory, the two key, key theories of physics, why are there two, why is not just one theory, one unified theory, as Einstein had hoped there would be. And, and so he's wondering, do we, need, do we need a new theory? Is that the issue, or is it a completely new order to physics, a new approach? And that was what he began to think about, what he called the implicate order. We need a radically new order. So that was where his thinking was when he arrived in Britain after his period of exile, that we need a radically new order to physics.